Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies to set your heart on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us on this 25th Sunday of Ordinary Time. One time, a college professor was teaching a lesson on the seven deadly sins, and he instructed his pupils, okay, before we begin discussing the sin of envy, I'd like you to write down every person you're envious of, but don't write them on paper. I want you to write each name on a potato and bring it to class. The students thought this was kind of creative, and they were kind of excited to see what he'd do with that. And so some students had two or three potatoes, while others brought in a whole sack. And they were really kind of hoping to air their grievances with all these people, right? I'm envious because this person boasts of the, all, all the time about their athletic awards. And this other one posts arrogant photos on Instagram showing off their bodies. And this other one, they didn't earn their wealth, and they definitely don't deserve it. But to their surprise, the teacher didn't actually address the issue at all just told him to bring the potatoes back the next day. So they did so, and the professor said, all right, now bring it back the next day. And so day after day, they were supposed to bring back the potatoes. After two weeks, the potatoes had begun to get heavy and burdensome and kind of smelly and rotten too. And so finally, after two weeks of assigning it, the teacher said, all right, now we talk about envy. This is what happens when you carry envy in your heart. It makes your heart heavy and weighed down and begins to rot just like these potatoes. Now get rid of all your potatoes and get rid of your envy. You know, all three of our readings today deal with envy and its consequences. The first reading describes the, uh, the envious machinations of the Pharisees who see Jesus as a threat because of his holiness. And of course, the Gospels portray the apostles as envious of one another. They're always angling to become the greatest among them. St. James, too, speaks about the consequences of envy, We see war and dissension and division. So let's look at that particular sin of envy and how to conquer it. First, we need to define it. Now, Aquinas defines envy as sorrow at another's good fortune. And this distinguishes envy from jealousy, because jealousy is not wanting to share something that you already have. So in a way, jealousy can be good, right? A husband should be jealous of his wife in the sense that he doesn't want anybody else to have his wife. So Envy, though, can envy, you know, sorrow at another person's good, can that ever be good? Actually, yes. St. Thomas Aquinas mentions two ways in which envy is good and two ways it's sinful. So envy can be helpful when we see an evil person receive a good thing that they're going to use wrongly, right? So if a corrupt politician becomes elected, it's kind of right to be sorrowful because knowing that the potential posi- their political position might be used to harm others. Or maybe if like a pleasure-loving, faithless drug addict wins the lottery, we're going to know they're only going to spend that money on something really bad that's going to hurt them. And so it's right to be sorrowful over that. Envy can also be helpful when it spurs us on to greater things, right? So if I see somebody who has a good physique from working out, I may be envious, but I may also want to do the same. Or maybe I see someone who's living a virtuous life and they radiate joy, and out of envy, I want to imitate that virtue, However, envy is very sinful in kind of two other ways. First, when we don't think the person is worthy of their blessings. You know, that's always wrong because God gives his blessings to both the righteous and sinners. I mean, how many times in our own life have we received blessings from God when we were unworthy of them? And the other cause of sinful envy too, according to Aquinas, is when we're angry that another person has simply received more blessings than us. This can even happen sometimes in the spiritual realm. Like St. Therese of Lisieux struggled with this. You know, when she was a young girl, she had this burning desire to become a martyr. But living in 19th century France, she didn't have too many opportunities to die for her faith. She then had a desire to be a missionary, but her poor health meant that she had, couldn't ever leave her hometown. And so she wrestled with God. She's like, you know, why can't I do something great for you? Why can't I become like those magnificent saints who live tremendously heroic lives? But she finally came to peace when she considered the variety of flowers in the garden. Right? Some are flashy and eye-catching, while others are kind of decked in just more subtle hues. And as she writes in her autobiography, she writes, quote, Our Lord has deigned to explain this mystery to me. He showed me the book of nature, and I understood that every flower created by him is beautiful, and that the brilliance of the rose and the whiteness of the lily do not lessen the perfume of the violet or the sweet simplicity of the daisy. I understood that if all the lowly flowers were to be roses, nature would lose its springtime beauty. And so it is in the world of souls, our Lord's living garden. He has been pleased to create great saints who may be compared to the lily and rose, 
but he's also created lesser ones who must be content to be daisies and simple violets flowering at his feet and whose mission is to gladden his divine eyes whenever he wants to look upon them. And all the more gladly they do his will, the greater their perfection. So what is this antidote to envy? If we see this unhealthy, sinful envy in our heart, if we get angry at another person's blessings because they have more blessings or they think, we think they're unworthy of them, there are three antidotes, one of which is very evident and two of which are rather hidden and you kind of have to think about them. So the evident one, of course, is gratitude, right? So often we forget all of our own blessings. We've been given way more than we deserve. Family and friends, life, good health, our Catholic faith. As Catholic speaker Chris Stefanik puts it, he said, none of us has to exist, but we get to. It's just awesome to be alive, and so everything else is a bonus. And really, I mean, counting our gratefuls helps to stave off envy. But I think there's two deeper ways to fight off envy as well. Because I believe that one reason that we're envious of others is because we think that someone else's blessings means that they are loved more by God. We sometimes falsely believe that a person's bigger paycheck or more expensive vacations, maybe their better health or more friends, means that somehow we're just loved less by God. You know, but that's not the case, right? And I think that's why Jesus chooses to hold a young child up as an example, because most children are secure in their parents' love. They know that they're unconditionally loved and they're safe in their parents' embrace, right? It's not a competition whether this child is loved more than the other child. And all Christians ought to know that they are so deeply, equally, un unconditionally loved by their Heavenly Father. I mean, if we've got the treasure of Christ and we know the depths of his love, really, what else do we need? What else do we need? I mean, of course, that's easier said than done, though, right? To be secure in your Father's love isn't a feeling, but it's an unshakable confidence that we are loved, not because of what we can do or produce, how we look or how successful we are, but because we are his, so I urge you, take a risk, believe in his love, and rest secure that no matter what others have, we are still infinitely, personally, passionately loved by God. Finally, I think a last antidote to the sin of envy. It's kind of interesting, but it's to realize that God has a unique, unrepeatable plan for our lives and that his plan is good and perfect and is directed to our holiness. So even if we don't have wealth, even if we're not successful, even if we don't have good health, we can surrender all this to our Heavenly Father, trusting that he's leading us along our own unique path to holiness, right? So rather than look to everyone else's lives and wish we were like them, we should just look to our own path and see the virtues and gifts that God wants to foster in us. I mean, ultimately, how many of the saints had really kind of unique paths to holiness? Probably a lot of them. One of my favorites is St. Benedict Joseph Labre. He was born in France in the 1700s, and he thought about becoming a priest, but he was rejected from three separate monasteries. He was too poor. He wasn't able to get letters of recommendation from influential people. He had bad health. And it would have been really easy for him to get, get angry and say, well, why me? Or to look to others' blessings. It would be like, Lord, why didn't you give me good health? Lord, why did you make me so poor? Lord, why do I not have connections like other people have? But instead, he said, Lord, I don't know where you're leading me, but I trust in you. So one day in prayer, he received an inspiration to go on foot to all of the holy pilgrimage sites throughout the world forever. The rest of his life was going to be traveling by foot to go visit the holy sites. And so he'd live his life really as a perpetual pilgrim, subsisting simply by begging for bread and praying for the world. What a unique mission. It's incredible that God chose this man to do this really kind of unique thing, and that would be his path to holiness. And so he traveled thousands of miles, sharing what little bread he had with the homeless, sleeping out under the stars, living a life of hardship and poverty. So every town he would enter, he'd spend long hours in front of the tabernacle before seeking out the company of the homeless to teach them about the Lord. God used this humble pilgrim in profound ways. In fact, he was known to do incredible miracles. Sometimes he multiplied bread for the homeless and healed the sick. And God even gave him the gift of levitation, which means actually floating while praying. There's been a few saints who have had that miraculous gift. Now, towards the end of his life, he made Rome his permanent home, continuing to beg and to minister to the homeless as a homeless man himself. St. Benedict Joseph Labre had a pretty unique call to holiness, not something that probably any of us in this church is called to do. But rather than blame God or grow envious of others for the, his lack of natural gifts, he just allowed God to use his poverty to make him a saint. 
My friends, envy is indeed one of the most deadly sins. It kills charity in the heart and rots away our peace and joy. But the antidote of gratitude, accepting the love of God, and rejoicing in the unique path God has planned for us, we can overcome envy to live a life of abundant joy.